Hi all, uh, this is going to be a fairly um, quick lecture, I think, on, on two chapters actually, 4.7 and 4.8. Um, those chapters are, the first one is introducing two methods, the proof by contradiction and proof, proof by, I, I say contraposition, although I think it's more typical people say just proof by contrapositives. But, um, but anyway, these two techniques will then be used in 4.8 to show you actually a couple of results that are that are sort of considered classic, you know, nuggets. They're they're really beautiful little arguments that uh, like everybody to know, frankly. So, uh, what are these two techniques? Let's let's do with the second one first. In a proof by contradiction, excuse me, proof by contrapositives, you basically. Um, you start out by saying this, proof, and instead of the normal first sentence, you say, consider instead the contrapositive statement. Now that presupposes you're talking about proving something that has a contrapositive statement. So, that is, your, your statement has to be a universal conditional sentence, has to be an if-then, and then you'll, you'll say what the contrapositive statement is. I'll just say it in, in generic terms, it's going to be for all x in some universe, um, that the negation of q of x implies the negation of p of x. Right, the, Assuming P of P implies Q was the original guy. So that would be the contrapositive of that. And then from here, you're just going to have a regular direct proof. So it's only indirect in that you're not proving the thing directly, but rather you're looking at its contrapositive pronunciation problem there. You're looking at its contrapositive and then proving that. So what, what would the, the second sentence be? Uh, it would be like, suppose x is a particular but arbitrary but don't laugh so can, and then say that not q of x is true or such that not q of x from there it's just like you were doing a direct proof um, the, the main well, the main place I see this coming up is it more as a piece of advice than anything else. Somebody's looking at a proof, they're working on it, they're pulling out hair, there's tears on the paper, they can't get anywhere. You say, you say to them, well, have you looked at the contrapositive? And, and they go, of course, you know, of course they say, of course I have, but you know, often if, 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 they, if they've gone that far that they're crying on the paper and everything, they probably have. But, but anyway, if, you, if you've gotten to a point where you're frustrated with trying to prove P implies Q, have a look at proving not Q implies not P, because we've previously seen those are equivalent logically. They have the same logical content. Proving the contrapositive statement is the same thing as proving the direct statement. The difference just is that you have different hypotheses. Here, we're, we're going to be assuming not Q. If we were looking at the direct P implies Q, we'd be assuming P. And it might be that assuming not Q just gives you more ammo to, to kill the problem than assuming P does. All right, so that's the crude out, well, not, not so much an outline, but how do we get started at least on a proof by contrapositives? If you, um, never know. let's do the second thing there. So we just took care of proof by contraposition. What about contradiction? To get started on a proof by contradiction, you most often will have a first sentence. Again, this is going to be a, a, not a not an ordinary direct proof, so we'll start with the the same first sentence that we've been getting used to. Um, there are multiple ways to phrase it, but one of my favorite is this: Suppose, by way of contradiction. I think actually 
it, that's in a positive phrase, so it needs commas at either end. Suppose, comma, by way of contradiction, comma, that... Now, what are we going to say after that? Well, it would depend on what the theorem that we were trying to prove it is, but basically, it's going to be the exact negation of the sentence you're trying to prove. We'll do some examples and you'll see what I mean by that. You just you suppose, by way of contradiction, that the exact opposite of the thing you're hoping to prove is true. Or another way to say it, the thing you're trying to prove is indeed false. Well, what, where from there? You're trying to reach a contradiction, which if, if you recall when we were, we were talking about the elements of logic, a contradiction is this sentence C you know, that has truth value is always false. Um, it is probably most easily got at by taking some logical sentence and ending it with the negation of that logical sentence. So, off, you know, this, this equivalence I'm showing is one of the ways you'll, you'll often see the C coming up. But the idea here is to start with the negation of your theorem, reason away from that, until you get to a completely absurd sentence. When you get to something that's a completely absurd, in other words, a contradiction, something that's literally, definitely false, you're done. Because what have you done? Well, You've, you've reached the, you've shown that the negation of your theorem is logically equivalent to something that's false. If the negation is false, what does that say about the original? Must be true. So, um, when you reach this point, a symbolic way to say you're done with the proof is to draw two arrowheads butting together like that. Or another approach you can do is put in a final sentence that says something like, this is a contradiction. So our original assumption that the theorem was false was wrong, and therefore the theorem is true. There's probably a fancier way to say that, but then you can end it with just the regular box or QED if you like. So the uh, let's, we're going to do some examples. The first one I'm going to show you is a proof by contraposition example. And um, the theorem we're going to prove by contrapositives is this. For all n in the, well, I could do it in the integers. If n squared is even, that implies that n is even. Sorry, I ran out of space. Let's just tuck even in down here. Okay, so if n squared is even, then n is even. Now, um, the converse of this we've looked at and we've proved, in fact. If you start assuming n is even, so n looks like 2k, when you square it, you get, not only is it even, it's divisible by 4. You get 4k squared. But if you just know the square is even, how do you figure out that the square root is even? You, you know, you can't start with n squared equals 2k and then try to square root that. That's just going to... It won't, you wouldn't be in the realm of integers anymore. So, how do we proceed? Well, we will consider instead the contrapositive. Got to check that the st sentence we've uh, we're trying to prove is already yeah it is already expressed as a universal conditional sentence, so coming up with its contrapositive isn't going to be so hard. It's for all n in the integers. Uh, the negation of n is even. That's n is odd. It implies the negation of n squared is even. That's n squared is odd. Uh, 
Oh, and then, so th this is really easy to prove, actually. I think we've even done it before. So, have we? Oh, I can't remember now. So what are we going to do? Start, start a direct proof of this statement now. Suppose n is a particular but arbitrary odd integer. First sentence down. Well, I guess it's second sentence in this particular construction. Maybe it's even third, because honestly, that's a sentence that's not a full sentence. I should have probably ended with a colon, and because there should be a period there at the end of that sentence. Anyway, uh, suppose in a particular but arbitrarily odd integer is the first sentence of the part that is the direct argument of the contrapositive. And our second sentence in this phase, really our third sentence, I don't know why I care about the order of the sentences. Uh, anyway, our next sentence is going to be, since n is odd, and, you know, we'll use the definition. Since n is odd, there is an integer k Such that n looks like 2k plus 1. Let me clear the board and we'll continue from the top. All right, so we've got that n, uh, n can be expressed as 2k plus 1. So then we need to get to our conclusion, which is about n squared being odd, then n squared, well that's 2k plus 1 squared, and the algebra of this is familiar now, isn't it? We get uh, 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. Which is equal to putting it in the shape of an odd number, 2 times 2k squared plus 2k, and then a plus 1 on the end. So this is actually showing us that n squared satisfies the definition of odd, because 2k squared plus 2k is an integer. Say something about closure axioms if you want right there, but it's okay to probably at this stage in your careers to just assert it. Uh, so since this guy is an integer, n squared satisfies the definition of odd. Um, attitudes differ at this point. I personally would probably grow my box now or my write QED. But if, if you, um, if people like to, um, put in a wrap up sentence now that says something about, well, since we've just proved the contrapositive, that means the original sentence is true. I think I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and skip that because that's my inclination that we don't really need to to uh, go into that level of detail, because we put a sentence in the very beginning that told the reader that we were looking at the contrapositive. And, uh, anybody who's done this stuff a little bit, you guys at this point, uh, will, will recognize that they're moving into the one, of, one of the standard proof techniques, proof by contraposition, and they'll go with it. All right, so that's actually going to be useful. Um, this, this is a thing that we've just done is what's called a lemma. A sort of small sub 
proof, a, a small sub-theorem, a theorem that's not really tough enough or, or big enough of a deal to be called a theorem, but you might need a, th a statement like this in order to prove something else. So we of you often call the things lemmas if they are um, of that sort. They're, they're the tools that you're going to use in a later proof. And we are going to use that particular lemma that n squared is even, implies n is even, very shortly. So let's look at a proof by contradiction, or rather, let's start by saying a statement of a proof that, sorry, statement of a theorem that we can prove by contradiction. What I want to do is take, for all, uh, take a, a set here for all x in the rational numbers and its complement. Um, we haven't actually written the notation for this before, but I'm going to introduce you to it now. And we'll see more of these in a sec, or well, in the next chapter. Um, for all x in q and for all y in, take the real numbers and subtract away, let's just use the subtraction symbol, the rationals. So this, this collection I'm talking about here is known as the irrational numbers. These guys are rational. This is the opposite of rational. They're the things that, well, the easiest way to say it is these things, the x here, or the, and the set that, that it's a member of are all the things that you can write as fractions. And y, and the set that it's from, is all the things that you can't write as fractions. So if I were saying this in words, it would be for every rational number and every irrational number, x and y respectively, well, what's the result going to be? If you add the two of them, What sort of thing do you think you will get? If you take an irrational number and you add an irrational number, could it be a fraction? Well, it turns out it can't be. It's got to be of the other sort, the sort like y. So let me again say it in words. The sum of a rational and an irrational is irrational. That's what we're having. Ah, so I, I cleared the board and then I want, wanted to go and write a little bit of stuff to get us started. First, I've just re-expressed the theorem that I was doing symbolically, just in words, the way it would probably normally come to us. It says the sum of a rational number and an irrational number is irrational. Um, and I also put the beginning, at least, of the, of the first sentence here. We're going to work by contradiction. So suppose, by way of contradiction, that and I need to say the exact opposite of what this is, the neg negation of that sentence. Well, it would be that there is, right? Because this was the sum of a rational number. It's implicitly universally quantified. So. When we negate a universal, we get an existential. There is a rational number. Let's come back here. Number x and n. What's the other thing going to be? Again, this was implicitly universally quantified. I, I think I was explicit about it before when I had it symbolic forms. But for all irrational numbers y, we're going to, since we're forming the negation, we're going to take the universal quantifier and turn it into existential. And there is an, I hope you don't mind me abbreviating the word irrational, I just ran out of word there. So an irrational number y such that if I add them up, when we added them up before, the theorem said that you would get something that was irrational. But if I'm taking the negation of this, 
I not only negate or not only switch the quantifiers, I, I change that conclusion. So I want x plus y to be rational. Okay, there's our first sentence. Now, what? remember our goal here, which is a little bit of a perverse goal. We're trying to argue until we show that um, this assumption leads us to something crazy. Right? We're trying to get to um, a, truly a contradiction, often in the form of some statement P and the negation of that statement P. So how do we do that? Well, that's... That's where the art form comes in. In this case, what I'm going to do is concentrate on this idea that x plus y is rational. Um, because I think I can also show that it's irrational. No, wait a minute. Better yet, let's not pick on x plus y being rational. We'll work with that. But here's the thing I'll, I'll take. The idea that y is irrational. An irrational number y. Our setup says, yeah, we've got x that's rational, and y is irrational, and we know that x plus y is rational. All right, let, let me just sort of uh, begin at the bottom of the board, and then we'll erase and go to the top. Maybe not even erase, just kill off the theorem anyway. So, um, since x and x plus y are rational, well, that means there are integers, there's a bunch of them, I mean, what, four of them, how about a, b, c, and d, Such that oh, <laughs> that's weird. Such that x equals a over b and x plus y equals c over d. And we won't really need this, but um, b and d are non-zero. And to be honest, we, we could probably get away without even referring to this whole integer thing, because we previously proved that the difference of two rational numbers is rational. And what is the difference of x plus y and x? Well, they differ by y. That's rational since, well, what do we need to know to, to show that this fraction implies y is rational? The top's got to be an integer, the bottom's got to be an integer, and the bottom has to be non-zero. that do for me? I've just shown you that y is a rational number, but one of our presumptions up front was that y was an irrational number. That's the thing that I, I kind of did the squiggly underline for. Under. 
there is an irrational number y. Y is supposed to be irrational. All right, so I think I can knock that part off. Let's, let's really drive the point home to our reader so that they get it. Um, thus, y is in q. It's a rational number. And from the original presumption, y is, well, not in q. Or you can say it's in that set r minus q. Anyway, this is crazy, isn't it? How can a thing be in a set as well as not be in that set? And that's good for us because we don't, uh, we don't, we want to reach a contradiction. So the original assumption is false, which means the theorem is true. assumption was we started out by saying assume by way of contradiction that and wrote down the negation of the theorem there's a word choice moment here some people like to say the theorem is true I like to focus on the fact that we've just shown it to be true, so I would say proved, but um, either one is fine. And then write QED or color in your box as you choose. All right, so those are our two proof techniques, contradiction, this one, and the previous one was contrapositives. Um, I'm going to show you two arguments, they're classic arguments from ancient Greece, actually, that, uh, that use these techniques. Actually, both of them use proof by contradiction. So that's cool. Um, the first one is the proof that square root of 2 is not a rational number. So there's our theorem. It's pretty quick. You need to write it down because it's just saying, it's just asserting this one thing about a number, square root of 2 is not rational. You can't write root 2 as a fraction. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting story about this particular result, uh, which goes back to at least to Euclid, but um, there's some question whether it might have been done, done by Pythagoras. I think, I think the consensus is that it was. Um, what we don't know is whether that was what led uh, Pythagoras and his followers to commit murder. But they, it is known that they killed some, one of their cult members. So uh, I think his name was Pythias. The, we don't know quite what he did to get the rest of the cult pissed at him, but one possibility is this argument, that he, 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 they considered this one of their little secrets, you know, part of the, the stuff that only folks in the inner sanctum of the Pythagoreans were allowed to know. And uh, he maybe spilled the beans on that. The other possibility is that he gave away the existence of this shape of... Uh, well, this one's a little too, this is really nice though. It's made of Japanese maple and it's very accurately sawn. In, uh, it's a beautiful piece of uh, work, craftsmanship. But this one makes it perhaps easier to see. It's a shape that you can get built by making uh, 20 triangular faces all joined together into roughly a ball. So if people have done like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or other games like that, this is called D20. It's, you put numbers on each face and you can roll numbers between 1 and 20. Um, it's an interesting shape. It's not something that most people would intuitively realize you could have. You know, a, a, a dice that has six sides, sure, that's just a box. And dice with four sides, I think people can picture the tetrahedron shape, the four triangles fitting together, but that you could fit five triangles around a point and then end up with 20 triangles forming a, a ball-like structure. 
it was a little bit weird. So the Pythagoreans knew this, and they thought of that as one of their secret bits of arcane knowledge that the regular folk didn't know. So Pythagoras either gave up this, or he gave up that root two is irrational, or it might have been that root five is irrational. Whatever, they, they, they pitched him off a sailboat while they were all out taking a, a recreational sail, and I guess he couldn't swim. So that was it for Pythagoras. I just find it amazing that, that people get so excited about a theorem, but let me, let me try to give you a, a hint as to why the Pythagoreans would have cared so much. Their, their basic philosophy was that everything is made of number. They literally said all is number, meaning the universe is made up of numbers. Much like later people in Aristotelian philosophy thought the universe was made of air, fire, water, and earth. Um, and now we know that it's made out of quarks and leptons, and you know we've, we've all got our things. But they thought underlying reality was numbers. And who's to say? They might be right. Because of that, though, they believed that this was an affront, in a way. It was, uh, it was saying that there was a lack of perfection in, in the universe, that there was this weird number that could never be expressed as a fraction. Oh, so, yeah, I think I've, I've, I've botched this a little bit. The, the problem, if, if Pythagoras got killed over this, it was because he proved it. He proved that root two was not rational, and the rest of them went, what? You're ruining our religion, man. So they, that's why they get angry now. Uh, but it might, it might well have been the D20 thing, too. Who knows? And it's impossible to know at this point. Different people have different ideas about what, what went on. All right, so let's get on with it. Let's prove this thing. Um, the proof is going to be by contradiction. And here's a, a piece of advice that I like. If you start a proof that's not just a direct proof, let them know up front what you're doing. So proof by contradiction. Write it in parentheses. Now, how did I start my last proof by contradiction? I said, suppose to the contrary that. Um, here's another phrasing you could say. Or, wait a minute. No, I said, suppose by way of contradiction that. Here's another phrase then. Suppose to the contrary that. And what will that supposition be? It'll be the exact negation of this, that root two is indeed rational. Now, it's gonna take a little bit of work to show that that leads to something that's impossible. And along the way, we'll use that lemma about squares being even in place. Numbers are even, but let me try to roll through it. Suppose to the contrary that root two is rational. Well, what does that mean? Then there are integers A over B. Now, usually what happens when you're doing one of these proofs by contradiction is you, you roll through to the end and you finally realize what the contradiction is and you realize that it would have been better if you had said something about the thing that you were getting the contradiction to up uh, at the beginning. And I'm going to skip over that level of uncertainty and, sh and tell you right now what the thing is that we're going to get a contradiction to. Um, if I write root 2 as a over b, I can always arrange for these guys, a and b, to have no factors in common with each other. So, I mean, if they did have a factor in common, for instance, that if they were both even, you'd divide them both by 2, which wouldn't change what the ratio was, and then you, they wouldn't be both even. Or if they were, you could divide by two again. You could take out enough twos until they were both, you know, well, they didn't have a com common factor of two. So,
That's how you say in, in math speak that two numbers have no factor in common. You say their greatest common divisor is just one. They have no divisor that is in common between them, no factor that's in common between them. Um, and we also do need, well, actually, we're not going to need it, but uh, b would be non-zero. We're going we're gonna to actually get our contradiction because of that, that the GCD of a and b is one. Um, by the way, this style of proof is very definitely the sort that you don't usually just write it out perfect the first time. So I don't, I'm going to kind of do that and, and give you the, the false impression here. But this style of proof, you're going to write a draft, realize at the end that you needed the GCD to be one, and then go back and fix it. Right? So, so multiple drafts of an, of an argument by contradiction are very common. All right. Where do we go from there? Well, notice that if you square both sides of this equation, you can turn it into something that, well, is just a relationship between integers. Let's do that here. Since root 2 equals a divided by b, it follows by algebra, it follows that a squared equals 2 times b squared. I hope you, you, you see how I got to that. I squared both sides of this, and then I multiplied both sides by b squared, so that the b squared is over there with the 2, and the a squared is by itself. And I am going to, um, I'm going to label that. I'm going to call that equation 1 a squared is equal to 2b squared. Well, that's kind of cool because what does that tell us? a squared is an even number. This is 2 times something. Let's see where, what, what that will help us with. Well, since a squared is even, uh, you know that there's an integer k where a squared looks like twice k. Oh no, wait, wait, oh, silly me. I don't want to just do that because to get to the, you know, I would run into the same problem I talked about before. Knowing the square is even doesn't really help you much in, uh, in getting that a is even. But what I really would like to know is that a is even. You'll see why in a second. So this was silly. What I should have said is, thus a squared is even. So by our lemma, remember the one we proved by, con by, proof by contraposition? Uh, a is even. And that's where we start, we get our, our 2k from. Right? We're going to say that a looks like 2k. I'm going to just to turn that in a comma and continue this run on sentence. So a equals 2k, where k is an integer. I guess I could work all the way down to the bottom now. Well, all right, what, what does that do for us? Well, we can substitute this value for a back into our equation one. Uh, that 2k squared is equal to 2b squared. 
frame. And now that's the same thing as 4k squared equals 2b squared. And finally, there's a 2 on both sides. So you can cancel that off and you get 2k squared equals b squared. Well, that's freaky because what does that tell us? Before, we figured out that a was even because a squared looked like a, an even number. It was twice something. Now we're going to figure out that b is even because b squared is, is an even number. And if the square is even, the, the lemma tells us the original thing is even. Hmm. Thus, b squared is even. So B is even. Well, if A and B are both even, their GCD is at least 2. That's a contradiction. Because we had the presumption that GCD of A and B was 1, and now we've got that it's greater than or equal to 2. You can't have it both ways, right? You can't be equal to 1 and also be 2 or larger. So, that's the contradiction you're hoping to get. Thus, our original assumption That's false. Right? The, the idea that root 2 is an element of the rationals is false because it led to a contradiction. So, root 2 is not an element of the rational numbers, 3D. It's kind of a pretty argument. There's other versions of it. We could have, for instance, we could have just uh, made, instead of saying the GCD of A and B was 1 up front, we could have said where A and B are not both even, clearly, just, just concentrated on their evenness. Uh, and then here we would have said they were, they indeed were both even, so we'd have, they're not both even, and they are both even. What do you do with that? You had a contradiction. All right, let's, uh, let's try to get this last one in. So this is the second result. It was also known back in antiquity. Um, I believe this is actually also something that's that's done in one of the books of Euclid. Everybody thinks of Euclid as just being geometry, but that's just the first five books, and he had like 17, I think, or at least 13. Anyway, there's a lot. So he does some algebraic type stuff, and 
uh, theory of numbers. There's even some uh, ideas of, of commensurability with sort of the, the, the beginnings of real analysis in, that, in those books. Anyway, the set of prime numbers is infinite. That was something that was known way back. And how's the proof going to work? My contradiction. Well, what's the exact opposite of this? The, the set of prime numbers is finite instead of infinite. to kind of elaborate on what it means for a set to be finite. Um, and it's in this elaboration of what it means to be finite that we'll, we'll get at something that will be a contradiction. So here's what I would say. If you know the set is finite, it means you can list all of them in a row, and there'll be a first one, a second one, and eventually a last one. So that's what I want to concentrate on. There is a complete finite list of the primes. And let me Harp on the completeness. What does completeness mean? It means that every prime is in this list. Now, it, it's a little hard to call a giant list of I, I want to say that we want to create a name for this list, but um, it's going to be a little rough because I don't think there's like a tiny number of primes. I know there's more than like, well, we know 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. I know it's at least 5, 13, 17, 19. Okay, so it's a bunch, right? But we're going to, we're going to have to do some name calling to say we, here, we've got this list. Um, what I'm going to do is start off with the first prime. I actually know that's two, and the second prime is three, and the third prime is five, and it goes like that. But eventually this list ends. There's a last prime, and we're going to call that one piece of it. So that's our list, P1, P2, P3, all the way out to... I don't know what this number n is, it could be a billion, right? But there's, there's definitely some limit on it under the assumption that there's a finite number of primes. The next bit is where somebody had a stroke of genius, I think. I mean, I, I don't know if I would have thought to do this myself. But now I've seen this proof enough times that it seems natural, but you know, if, if you put yourself in the, in the mindset of the person who was first originating it, how did they get this idea? Not sure. It's the idea is to create a number using all these guys. Um, what you want to do is take the product of all of them. P1 times P2 times P3 times dot 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 times Pn. And that is a highly composite number. It's the product of all the prime numbers that exist. And then you add one to it. That's this, a, a number n. Now, what's, what's the deal with number n? Well, if you think about dividing it by p1, it would go in p2, 3, all the way up to pn. This would be the quotient. 
but there'd be a remainder. And if you divide it by P2, there'd be a quotient of all the other primes besides P2, and then a remainder. And so um, note that N is not divisible by any of the primes. Here's a, um, a funny little moment. Um, a lot of people go, well, wait a minute, that means n is a prime. If it's not divisible by the other primes, you've just discovered a new prime. But that actually can't be true in the universe we're working in because pn here was supposed to be the biggest prime. And n? n is way bigger than pn. It's pn times all this other junk plus 1. So since n is larger than pn, It can't be prime. But its prime factors, whatever they are, are also not on our list. So what I've got now is a contradiction. I hope you see it, that on the one hand, n has prime factors that can't be on the list, but every possible prime factor is supposed to be on the list. This, this notion that n's prime factors aren't on the list, that contradicts the completeness of our list. sentences on up at the top. This contradicts the assumption that our list of primes was complete. So that's pretty strange because we made this assumption that the list was complete. We've got down to a, a wait, no, here's some new things that have to be on your list and they weren't on there before. Um, but that means the list wasn't complete. Contradiction. And so what's wrong? Our original assumption really was that the list of primes, that, that the number of primes was finite.
Thus, the assumption that the set of primes is finite is false, since it leads to a contradiction. So, the set of primes is infinite. Therefore, So our, um, that's it for today, or for the, this uh, stuff. Our, our uh, worksheet for Tuesday will include a little bit on these last two classical theorems. Um, more of a concentration, really. Uh, well, no, wait. I don't want to misspeak. There's actually three things that are going to be on that worksheet. Uh, some more proofs by uh, cases, and the methods of contradiction and contraposition, and then these, these classical theorems. See you Tuesday.